from Oklahoma sharing some of this story. This is the first time I've um, been back to Oklahoma since completing the book. Um, and uh, there's even a few descendants in the room related to Monroe Coleman, who's the subject of the second chapter of the book and who you hear a little bit about today. And so it's really wonderful to see um, so many of you here today, um, some family and others I hope to get to know in the Q&A and afterwards. Um, so I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Um, following, um, our, uh, following, the, following the talk. So I'll probably speak for about 35 minutes or so, including some, uh, a lot of photographs, a little bit of film, and then leave the remainder of the hour for, um, for your questions and love to hear about your own family histories and work that you may be doing related to this, um, this subject. Okay, so I'm going to start by sharing the, um, a portion of the preface of my book, which kind of introduces the reader to, uh, to me and to, and to how I came into this project um, by way of my family. <coughs> in New Jersey, our family was black. Well, back home in rural Oklahoma, we were Creek Indian, too. As a child in the 70s and 80s, most of the 80s, I loved nothing more than listening to my grandmother's stories about growing up African American and Creek Indian in 1920s Oklahoma. In the long wake of the Newark riots, Newark, New Jersey, watching Odivia Brown Field, this is a picture of my grandmother when she was a child, plant tomatoes in the patch behind her house, I learned from her about a time when our family had owned, she said, hundreds of acres of land alongside Indian and African descended kin. Grandpa Brown had a place they called Brownsville, she said, where they built a school and a church. I learned, too, about the oil speculators who gradually came to see my great-grandfather. For the occasional lump sum, he worked as a Muscogee translator across Oklahoma, telling them, she said, quote, just where to look for oil, unquote. Through my grandmother's stories, I learned about Indian and African-American land loss. About once a year, she would pull out the $25 check she'd received back in New Jersey from Sun Oil Corporation insisting that I look at it too. I remember how she stared at that check, asking questions, already knowing the answers. In grade school, I memorized occasional facts about slavery and the Trail of Tears, but it was only through my grandmother that I learned about the intersection of the two, that some Native Americans had in fact held slaves, that some African Americans had participated in the land runs, and that the North American frontier was far more complicated than my textbooks let on. During summertime visits to Oklahoma, we began collecting evidence. My Uncle Thurman, oh, no. Is this on? I think this is not, maybe not on. Yeah, can you just talk a little while? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My great uncle Thurman would take us out to Brownsville, driving red dirt roads for hours, following the perfectly rectangular perimeter of the thousand acre home place. There was no longer a house, but we found the steps to the school amid a landscape of tall grass, Indian paintbrushes, and oil wells. One year at a YMCA summer camp back east, when I stumbled across a collection of Indian creation myths nearly identical to the bear rabbit folk tales my father occasionally told me as a child, I ran to a payphone to call him, and we still had payphones. <laughs> was Bear Rabbit Indian, black, or both, I asked. <laughs> These were the wrong questions. But at the time, back east, there was barely language for what I wanted to know. There was, thankfully, the language of family. When I moved away to college, my family story stayed with me, quietly hi highlighting the incompleteness of other historical narratives. Long before I cared for the discipline of history, my grandmother's stories made me whole, pointing to things I sensed, but for which I had no words. The writer Ronnie Hartfield has written, our mother's stories have given us the maps by which our tribe locates its journeying, its streams and rivers, its stony places, its sometimes astonishing, more often incredibly affirming twists and turns. Another writer, e. Francis, Wright, e. Francis White, has attested that her own grandfather's stories were, she said, so wonderful that I began to believe that they could not be true. As she grew older, however, she stopped worrying about whether they were true. 
She said, what is important here is that my grandfather told me the stories. The stories made sense to me. And most important, the stories made sense of the world for me. As an adult, I also grew less interested in the veracity of our family stories and more interested in the power and the pride that we all drew from them. In recent years, some psychologists have begun to examine this thing that human beings have long understood, what they call the importance of a strong intergenerational self, children knowing that they belong to something bigger than themselves. One study revealed that in the face of conflict and tragedy, quote, the more, cert the more children know about their family's history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, the higher their self-esteem, unquote. These findings have particular implications that I think are both urgent and hopeful for African American communities. Forcibly separated from family members by the first and then the second middle passage, by slavery and the slave trade, we're also separated in large part from family histories. Frederick Douglass opened his 1892 biography this way. He said, the reader must not expect me to say much of my family. Genealogical trees did not flourish among slaves, unquote. Rooted in the repetitive social trauma of separation and haunted by the need to know, Heather Williams has written that in the post-emancipation era, descendants searched for those who'd been lost through the sale or through the negligence of history. When this search extended beyond the history of individuals or individual families, it began to help construct the history of a people. She writes, just as enslaved children were stunned when they found out that they could be sold, some people are still stunned by the blow, including the deprivation of family. People cannot fathom it, and they want to reestablish and reclaim that history. And so we have. Dorothy Redford, a descendant and genealogist from North Carolina, recalled, I began as a woman alone, drifting in both time and space. But by the end of her genealogical project, she had a past peopled, quote, with links as strong and solid as any family in this nation. As she pieced together the lives of their ancestors and organized a reunion on the grounds, all the slaves on the plantation became her people, unquote. So on July 9th, 1977, the New York Times published an article about organ transplantation uh, with a photograph of my mother, my father, still working. My mother, my father, my grandmother, and me. I don't know if this is still working. Now. It is okay. Um, Having developed kidney failure at 19 in 1968, my father received from my grandmother an early experimental kidney transplant. The article stated that before the operation, my grandmother would go down to the basement to be alone as he struggled for breath. Everybody would be asleep, she said, and I'd just scream because he was dying before my eyes, unquote. When I was born, some years after the surgery that had taken place, the doctors told my father that he'd be lucky to live to see my fifth birthday. Thank you. But with the help of my mother's fight, my father kept living, eventually becoming, thank you, a kidney doctor himself, trying to understand the illness and its prevalence, especially within African American communities. And he carried me well into my 20s. Over the years, various theories emerged about his kidney disease. Somehow, they all led back to Okmulgee, Oklahoma where he spent his first five years in the 1940s. Sometimes my grandmother talked about what she called Greasy Creek, the oil-rich creek where they would play, wondering about its effects. Other times she mentioned the day he fell into a gigant gigantic Oklahoma anthill. The theory that registered with East Coast doctors in the 1980s amounted to untreated strep throat and a lack of antibiotics during his early years. The final unspoken one had to do with leaving Oklahoma. My father had been raised by his grandparents those first few years of his life in a country town where he was adored by a large extended family. And amid a contentious return to his mother and father in New Jersey, the separation was traumatic. Thereafter, he'd returned to Oklahoma each summer with his younger sister, Beverly, to be with his mama and papa, as he called them. But there was a longing that never quite healed. He seemed to cling to Oklahoma for life. When, okay. Sorry. When my father passed away in 2004, having survived nearly four decades of illness, including a stroke that caused him to lose all of his speech, I stumbled back into history and found his curiosity and love of life waiting for me there. He loved Oklahoma and the stories that reside there more than the many places he'd traveled in his 57 years. 
Making sense of our loss together, my then 85-year-old grandmother accompanied me on nearly every research trip I made to Oklahoma, Mississippi, and Alabama. She was every bit as curious as I, as I was and far more skillful at enlisting others to come along for the ride. In the 10 years that followed my father's death and preceded my grandmother's, Odivia Brownfield and I made the unspoken decision to dwell in the past. I remember clearly the two of us were racing back from a morning fact-finding expedition, hoping to arrive to Sunday buffet at the Sirline Stockade in Okmulgee in time before her eldest sister, Marzetta Wesley, scolded us. We had already missed church. We arrived just in time to find my grandmother's cousin, Clifford Fields, who some of you know. We shared with Clifford what we were up to, and he immediately took me under his wing and proceeded to share with me the decades of scattered genealogical notes he'd been collecting since the 1960s. In the years since that meeting, Clifford has driven me down hundreds of country roads, knocked on dozens of doors, and asked nearly every question that no one else dared to ask. Like many historians, I think, I first learned the meaning of change over time within my own family as I listened to these mythical stories of long lost black land ownership from the vantage point of the post-civil rights era. And as I watched my father decline, a pillar of our family fall, and my own world ever, gra ever so gradually collapse. Surrounded by secrets and the threat of separation through time and space, my job first as a daughter and later as a historian became putting the pieces back together. I wanted to know how one generation shaped the next, why these stories were repeated, and where the shadows came from. I was drawn to what memoirist Susanna Lassard calls the family architecture. Like Lassard, this architecture taught me how short time is, how close the generations are, how powerfully lives reverberate down through the structure of family deeply affecting each other. Because in our response, we in turn create the unseen structure in which our children must live. Okay, so I'm gonna um, tell you a little bit about what, what I do in the rest of the book. I won't, won't tell it all in case anyone wants to buy the book. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll try to give you a bit, bit of an overview of, the, of the, some of the characters that I trace. Um, they are a bit of characters themselves, but they are also real people. <laughs> um, so as a child, I often heard my grandmother say, Grandpa went back to Africa with Garvey. She would repeat that. Two decades later, when I learned that Garvey, in fact, Marcus Garvey, never actually made it to Africa, I asked the obvious question, well, then who did Grandpa go with? Um, and stumbled upon what was, to me and to many people at the time, a little known or not known at all, Chief Sam Back to Africa movement that had actually preceded the Garvey movement, in which thousands of formerly enslaved women and men responding to the rise of violence and political disfranchisement, the lack of the vote, basically, in the US, uh, especially here in Oklahoma at that time, raised $100,000 in 1912 and 13, a great deal of money, to purchase a German steamship and migrate to West Africa. I found this movement not in Harlem, where we usually associate um, Garvey and the UNIA, um, not in the Caribbean, not in um, Chicago, uh, but in the former Creek Nation, in the Black and Indian borderlands of Oklahoma. Building on these bits and pieces of family stories within my own family, uh, the book is really about the migratory, the kind of moving lives of freedom's first generation. A generation of women and men who were born enslaved, who were children at the time of emancipation, and who together navigated the rise and then the fall of Reconstruction within and beyond the US South and Southwest. Um, so I traced three individuals and their families. Um, there were lots of stories about the three men who ended up kind of um, structuring the book. Um, there were not as many readily available stories about the women, so I had to do a lot more work to try to figure out, you know, how did the women relate to these men who everyone talked about so much. So anyway, the first of these was a man named Thomas, Thomas Jefferson Brown, um, and this is a picture of his son, Charles Brown. He's my grandmother's uh, father here, and Thomas Jefferson Brown was my grandmother's grandfather. So between 1865 and 1915, so in that um, you know, 40, 50 year period between the end of uh, slavery in the US South and the beginning of what we usually think of as the Great Migration, there was a whole lot of movement, right? That historians and, and publicly we don't often talk about. And of course in Oklahoma you probably know this well or better than the rest of the country, but there's a lot of movement happening in those 50 years before the Great Migration. Um, and this included people moving uh, to places like Indian Territory and then Oklahoma. 
experimenting in, in kinds of land ownership, town building, emigration activity across the Mississippi Delta, Arkansas, Kansas, Indian Territory, Texas, West Africa, um, Canada, Mexico, and beyond. Uh, deepening and widening uh, the roots of great migration, I suggest in the book that the lives and choices of these individuals really should challenge our ideas about freedom's first generation, right? How we think about this as domestic, as in only about the US, and also how we think about this as um, kind of biracial, as black and white, when in fact it's often much more complex. Um, so this is a story of a group of African American migrants whose lives were defined by the pursuit of freedom. So Thomas Jefferson Brown, Monroe Coleman, and Alexander Davis are the three men who kind of structure these chapters. Um, Brown was the son of an African American father and, um, as my uncle Thurman called her, an Irishman. Um, he, said, she, he used to say his mommy was an Irishman. Um, and so uh, Thurman was raised in uh, near Wetumpka and then later um, in the Okamogi area. Um, by his uh, grandfather, Thomas Jefferson Brown. So as you probably know, if you do you know, work, family history work in your own families, someone being raised by their grandparent often gives unique kinds of access to the past, right? Because you get different stories and you get them across a broader span of time, right? Um, so Thurman was an incredible, um, you know, just a partner and, and resource throughout this project. And he even had some letters from 1901, 1903 um, that were exchanged between members of the family about getting registered during the Dawes Commission. Um, so Thomas Jefferson Brown uh, migrated from Arkansas to Indian Territory in the 1870s. It's a map of Indian Territory at the time. Um, and once there, he was married uh, two different times uh, to uh, African Creek or Black Indian descendants of uh, first of the Creek Nation and then of the Creek and Seminole Nation. Um, one was designated Creek, one as Seminole. Uh, Pierre Bruno was one of the relatives of his first, uh, sorry, of his second wife, Julia Simon. The first wife was Aurelia Bruner. So in this period of Dawes allotment, Thomas Jefferson Brown, who his children described as a quote unquote white looking man, was able to secure more than a thousand acres of land, a school, a church, and a post office, founding what they called Brownsville. Um, in Indian Territory and early Oklahoma. Now this place was, um, was really, none of this land was his, right? But it was, it was kind of attached to him in, in, in memory, right? in terms of how the family members described it later as kind of the patriarch. But he actually was not Creek by blood, nor was he Creek free, freeman, right? But he had married into a family, right, that was. And so his children each were able to receive 160 acres of land. And um, with the help of other relatives, they were able to get these allotments next to each other, such that they added up to the 1,000 acres. So when I was um, coming back as a child in, in the summers, Uncle Thurman would take us, drive us around on mostly dirt roads, what had been this allotment. And now, of course, it's, it's oil land and it's got barbed wire around it, but we would go and it would take a very long time, not just because they were dirt roads, to get around this, this, this land. And, and that partly probably was inspiration for my later curiosity because growing up where I did in New Jersey, you know, where you know, my grandmother was planting tomatoes in you know, a, a space probably <laughs> this big, and the idea that this land had been in the family was, and it just kind of defied uh, my imagination um, for, for, and so I wanted to, to know more. Yeah. So, um, in the book, I use Brown's story to talk about how early settlers, African American settlers, were able to bolster their claims to freedom, that is freedom from bondage, right? Um, by attaching themselves in some ways to American expansion, also to Native Americans, and to the acquisition of land. And of course, they were, as they did so, they were mingling with white settlers who were crafting new identities for themselves in the territory. Um, okay, so by the time Monroe Coleman, who's pictured here with his sons, um, bought the plot adjacent to Brownsville, so right across the way from, Brown, from, from the Brown and Simon land, he was participating in a much larger emigration movement. Now, Monroe Coleman is about 20 years younger than Thomas Jefferson Brown, um, and they, Tom, Monroe Coleman's uh, uh, daughter married Thomas Jefferson Brown's son, and so that's how these two families came together. Now, Monroe Coleman had a very different story, uh, but they were nonetheless my grandmother's two grandfathers, are Monroe Coleman and Thomas Jefferson Brown. So Coleman was born in northeastern Mississippi in 1869 to a freed woman and, uh, as far as we can tell, her former children. 
Coleman migrated at the turn of the 20th century in the fervor of uplift and very prideful black town building and purchased a plot of land in the territory from a Creek Freedman. In the book, I talk about Coleman's decision to participate in kind of the black town building movement, black town movement, within the context of his early life as someone categorized as mulatto, quote unquote, in Mississippi, rumors of white parentage, and, um, and more. So while the rise of you know, black Oklahoma and kind of black town Oklahoma was really promoted as an all black and kind of domestic movement, really there's a lot more complexity there that I think is, is um, exciting to explore. So throughout this vast transformation of color and race and kinship, class remained. And so I trace the migratory life of, of the third and final migrant in the book, Alexander Davis, who was a preacher and also a farmer who led his cousin Monroe Coleman to the territory. And they had some different experiences. So Eric was raised by the Coleman's. So he lived in a Coleman household in Mississippi. Um, and he moved his family to a farm near, near the black town of Mount Bayou, Mississippi, in the Delta, before moving on to the new state of Oklahoma. But Davis's experiences were not identical to Coleman's. Lomi Davis, who's pictured at the top left here, that was one of Alexander and, and Della Watkins' daughters. Um, she gave an interview in the 1980s uh, before she died, and she had memories from the 1890s of, of this time in the Delta. And the interview is actually on cassette tape, and I, I found it in, in Mississippi. Um, and so now it's on a more permanent <laughs> form. Um, but in, in this interview, um, Lomi said, about her Coleman cousin. She said, some of my relatives in Mississippi, oh, they were very wealthy. They didn't pay attention to the rest of us. I don't know how they got that way, but they did. They seem to have gotten up in the world. As a child, her father, um, Alexander Davis, um, it, she said he had been sold after emancipation, so in the late 1860s. So there was a period of this kind of unclear, right, long period of unclear freedom in which people who were considered minors or whose parents were determined to be um, uh, you know, not allowable by you know, who, who's deciding that, the former slave owners, right? Those children were essentially remained enslaved for many more years after 1865. And so it appears that that's the case with Alexander Davis in those early years. Um, and later as a young man, while Monroe and the other Coleman boys were educated, Davis, who lived in the same home, was working. At nightfall, he would study his cousin's school books. Uh, alongside the sunflower near Mount Bayou, Lomi recalled how exploitative the cotton business was for their family. She said, one time my father was on a farm. We made 14 bales of cotton. This is in a sharecropping arrangement. And so my father said, I guess we'll go sell the cotton. But this man says, no, I sell the cotton. And he took all the cotton and sold it. After that, Lomi recalled, my father, he'd maybe come home and he'd make us some mush out of cornmeal and that's all we could have to eat. I remember well we had nothing but cornmeal. According to her nephew, it was time to move on, and that's when they come to Oklahoma. Um, the Davis family headed to uh, the new state of Oklahoma in 1907, and with very little property in their name, they instead rented a, a one-room house with a kitchen and an attached tent. Eric had, uh, and his family were there for the next six years or so before they joined this Back to Africa movement that I referred to earlier. Um, they moved then to what was referred to as a tent city. South, they called it South Gold Coast. It was actually in present in clear border of Clearview and Walika, uh, and readied themselves to leave the United States for the Gold Coast of West Africa, present day Ghana. So what happened in these six years, right? And, and you may be familiar with some of this. So immediately following statehood, uh, Jim Crow laws were passed uh, and, and policies were adopted to restrict African Americans from assembling in any numbers beyond a few and to impose segregation in housing, schools, and railroad cars. Um, they were, they were um, essentially prohibited from voting by violence and also by the grandfather clause and from participating in state and local politics. On Christmas Eve of the first year of statehood, an African-American man named James Garden became the victim of Oklahoma's first recorded lynching. And there were many more in the next few years. Uh, and this is really tremendously um, a tremendous paradox, right? Because even just eight years prior, 10 years prior, 20 years prior, there had been all sorts of hope that Oklahoma would be the place, right, for formerly enslaved women and men and their families and children looking for a more free place outside of a place like the Mississippi Delta or parts of Arkansas, right? 
Um, and in fact, there had been a proposal on the table in the late, 1800, late 1880s for Oklahoma to become, or part of Oklahoma to become a black state. Um, and Edward McCabe had actually gotten a meeting with the President of the United States at the time, Benjamin Harrison, about this potential. Right? Um, that, of course, did not come to pass, but you had these, these um, uh, the, the kind of bubbling up of these towns and communities, formal, informal, um, that was incredibly hopeful. Um, Ida B. Wells, um, the tremendous um, writer and speaker and activist of the, and journalist of the late 19th century, uh, out of Memphis, she encouraged, after a, num after a spate of violence in, Me in Memphis, she encouraged the entire community to pick up and walk to Oklahoma. I mean, this, Oklahoma was going to be the next place. Um, so the same year, that, uh, so around the same time, uh, many uh, uh, Oklahomans began to limit access to land. So a group of farmers in Ofusky County in 1911, signed an oath that pledged, I'll just read the quote here, quote, never, to never rent, lease, or sell land in Ofusky County to any person of Negro blood or agent of theirs, unless the land be located more than one mile from a white or Indian resident. So here you also see how the Jim Crow um, laws and policies that were adopted, right, kind of deliberately separated African Americans, not only from white Americans, but also from Native Americans, right, in terms of how segregation would work. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about this, this after, after, um, after. So um, one of the, the most infamous and, and kind of tragic um, moments in all of this is that in, uh, in 1911, there was a lynching of a 33-year-old woman and, and her son uh, and over the br bridge of the North Canadian River, or South Canadian River, sorry. And perhaps not surprisingly, this bridge was located just a few miles from the land that would soon become known as South Gold Coast, from the, from the kind of heart of this Back to Africa movement. And it's very clear. I mean, it, it, you can even see one location from the other, right? The people are picking up in response to this. So um, this was a far cry from the dream of Oklahoma as an all-black state, and even from the dream of towns like Bowie. This is a picture of members of the town council of Bowie. Um, and what happens uh, in my final chapter is, is that many of these individuals, hundreds of black Oklahomans, pick up and say, and basically look for a pla another place to go. So they form emigration clubs. Um, some uh, participate in migration to Canada of about 1,000 Oklahomans. Some move south to Mexico. And in the case of Coleman and his family pictured here, as well as the Davis family, they end up joining this uh, Back to Africa movement. And I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A, but they basically leave behind that house and they put everything they have into this movement. This is a picture of the stock certificates that circulate during this period um, on behalf of the movement. So people purchase these for about $25 each, or exactly $25 each. Some people purchased more than one, but most people purchased a couple. Um, and this one belonged to um, the J.P. Owens family. J.P. Owens was a child at the time of the movement, and his parents were both members of this movement. His daughter, Elaine Owens, still lives out near Clearview, and she found this, had had this actually in her, in her uh, house because it had meant a great deal to her father who wrote about the movement. There's many articles documenting the history of this movement. This, is, this one is from the African Pioneer, which was actually an Oklahoma-based newspaper dedicated to the movement. Uh, there were also, you know, the black press was covering the movement, um, the Tulsa Star, many, many other um, outlets were covering at the time. There are also newspaper articles coming out of the Gold Coast and West Africa documenting this movement. So it was really of international importance. Uh, this is a picture of one of our visits to, to Clearview today, not far from where the camp is. Some of you may be familiar with all of these places. And this is one of the grave sites um, where some of the children died while waiting that winter for the ship to come. So as you can probably tell, my own family knowledge, oh, this is the ship that they purchased, the one on the left here. And they bought the ship for $69,000. And then the remainder of that 100000 they um, had to do a lot of work to get the ship, kind of make it seaworthy. And that included, because it was shortly, a couple years after the, the sinking of the Titanic, 
that included installing wireless radio technology and other kinds of technologies. This picture of the daughter and the son that married, as I said before, the kind of brown line and the Coleman line coming together. Okay, so I'm gonna just reflect now a little bit on the um, on storytelling here. So as you can tell um, and see from these stories, my own knowledge of this generation really came from family stories first. And while I followed the lead of my, my um, relative stories, I also kind of tested these stories and 